speaker is one of the world's most respected authorities on the subjects of forgery, embezzlement, and secure documents. He lectures extensively at the FBI Academy and for the field offices of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. More than 14,000 financial institutions, corporations, and law enforcement agencies use his fraud prevention programs. What you are about to hear is the astonishing story of how he went about gaining his credentials. His life story is so incredible that it is the subject of a soon-to-be-released film starring Leonardo DiCaprio. You will hear his story, and yes, the moral of the story as well. Please welcome Frank Abagnale. Good morning. My pleasure to be here this morning. I've been asked to talk a bit about my life, which uh, I wrote in a book when I was 26 years old called Catch Me If You Can. Ironically, Catch Me If You Can, 25 years later, is still in the bookstores, has sold over 3 million copies, and still in print now in more than 19 countries and nine different languages around the world. Like all books, it has a beginning and has an end, should be entertaining, should be interesting, and like all books, it should have a moral. I was raised just north of New York City, uh, about 25 miles to the north, in a little town called Bronxville, New York, one of four children. I was educated by the Christian Brothers of Ireland in a private Catholic school called Iona, where I went to school from kindergarten to high school. By the time I had reached the age of 16 and the 10th grade, an IQ of 140, almost a perfect photographic memory. After 22 years of marriage one day, my parents decided to get a divorce. Unlike most divorces, where the children are usually the first to know, my parents were very good about keeping that a secret. I remember sitting in class when the father walked in the classroom and had the brother excuse me from class. I remember driving with the father up to the county seat in White Plains, New York, where he explained to me that my parents would meet me and tell me what was going on. I remember walking up the steps of the big stone building that said family court, but had absolutely no idea what that meant. When I arrived in court, unfortunately court was already in session, so I was ushered into the back of an immense courtroom to be ushered down to stand between my parents who were already in front of the judge. I remember that the judge never looked at me, just reading from notes the judge told me that my parents were getting a divorce. And because I was 16 years of age, I had to tell the court which parent I wanted to live with. I started to cry, so I turned and ran out of the courtroom. Judge called for a 10-minute recess, but by the time my parents got out to the lobby, I was gone. My mother never saw me again for seven years. My father, unfortunately, never saw me again, ever. In the mid-1960s, running away was a very popular thing in America. Unfortunately, a lot of people got into Haight-Ashbury, the hippie scene, the drug scene. Instead, I took a few belongings from my home, packed them in a backpack, boarded what was then the New Haven and Hartford Railroad for the short train ride down to Grand Central Terminal in New York. My father owned a large stationery company in Manhattan at the corner of 40th and Madison. Like all of us, we had to work there in the summertime, so I knew the city very well, so I started looking for the same type of work. There were a lot of signs on the window, stock board, delivery boy. I'd walk in and apply. So tell me, young man, how old are you? Sixteen. How far did you go in high school? Tenth grade. I'll hire you. And I went to work for a few hours a day, but I soon realized I couldn't support myself on the money they were paying me. And that probably the only way they would pay me more money or give me more hours is if they believed I was an adult. At 16, I was six foot tall. I've always had a little gray hair since I was about 15. My friends used to say when we had to wear a suit once a month, I looked more like a teacher than a student. So I decided to lie about my age. In New York, we had a driver's license at 16. Back then, they didn't have pictures on them, just an IBM card, so I altered one digit of my date of birth. I was actually born in April 1948, but I changed that four to a three. That made me 10 years older, or 26 years old. I walked around applying for the same type of work. People did give me a little more money, 
gave me a few more hours. But even then, it was difficult to make ends meet. One of the few things I had taken with me when I left home was a checkbook. I had a checking account at a small bank in Mount Vernon, New York, mainly for school books and supplies. I had a couple of hundred dollars in the account, so every so often I would supplement my income and write a check, $10, $15. The funds were there. But it was my friends, my peers, who would say to me, you know, Abigail, you're the only guy who walks into a bank in the middle of New York. You have no account there. You don't know a soul. You walk over and talk to somebody at a desk, and they okay your check. Oh, well, my checks are good. Yeah, but if I walked in there, they wouldn't touch my check. You walk in, they don't bat an eye. Years later, reporters would say that that was my upbringing, mannerisms, dress, appearance, speech, whatever it was, it was very easy to do. So consequently, when the $200 ran out, I kept writing those checks. Of course, uh, my father had a great deal of political influence over New York politics. He had the police making a very special effort to find me as a runaway. That and the bad checks, I thought maybe it was a good time to start thinking about leaving New York City. But I was quite apprehensive about going to Miami, Chicago. I wondered if they would cash a check in Miami as quickly as they did in New York. I was walking up 42nd Street one afternoon, about 5 o'clock in the evening, pondering all of these things, 16 years old, when I started to approach the front door of an old hotel that used to be there called the Commodore Hotel, now the Grand Hyatt. Just as I was about to get to the front door of the hotel, out stepped an Eastern Airline flight crew onto the sidewalk. Couldn't help but notice the captain, the co-pilot, the flight engineer, about three or four flight attendants dragging their bags across the sidewalk to the curb to load them into the van. As they loaded them in, I thought to myself, what a perfect front if I could pose as a pilot. I could travel all over the world for free. I probably could get just about anybody, anywhere, to cash a check for me. So I walked up the street a little further to 42nd and Park, and when I went to cross over, I looked up, and there was the 55 floors of the Pan Am building, Pan Am the nation's flag carrier, the airline that flew around the world. I thought, what a perfect airline to use. So the next day, I placed a phone call to the executive corporate offices of Pan Am. When the switchboard was ringing, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to say. When they answered, Pan American Airlines, good morning, may I help you? Uh, yes, I'd like to speak to someone, um, someone in the purchasing department. Purchasing? One moment. And the clerk came on and said, yes, sir, maybe you can help me. My name is um, John Black. I'm a co-pilot with the company based out of San Francisco. You know, I've been with the company about seven years, but I've never had anything like this come up before. What's the problem? Well, we flew a trip in here last night. We're continuing out today. Yesterday, I sent my uniform out through the hotel to have it dry clean. Now the dry cleaner in the hotel said they can't find it. Here I am with a flight in about four hours, no uniform. Don't you have a spare uniform? Certainly back home in San Francisco, but I'd never get it here in time for my flight. You understand that this would cost you the price of a new uniform? I understand. Hold on, I'll be right back. Came back and said, my supervisor says you need to go down to the well-built uniform company on Fifth Avenue. They're our vendor. I'll call them and let them know you're on the way. Well, that's exactly what I wanted to know, so I went down to the well-built uniform company. Little fellow, Mr. Rosen, fitted me out in the uniform. Back then, they were black gabardine, the three gold stripes on the arm of the co-pilot. I certainly looked old enough to be the pilot. When he was all done, I said, how much do I owe you? Well, the uniform's $286. I said, no problem, I'll write you a check. <laughs> so, no, we can't take any checks. I said, oh, well, I'll um, just pay you cash. No, we can't accept cash. You need to fill out this computer card. Then in these boxes, you put your employee number. Then we bill this back under uniform allowance. Comes out of your next Pan Am paycheck. That's even better. Go ahead and do that. <laughs> I don't know who paid for the uniform, but out the door I went. In New York, there were two airports at the time, LaGuardia and Kennedy. LaGuardia was about 20 minutes from Manhattan. Kennedy was about 50, naturally LaGuardia being the closer of the two. That's where I went. I spent most of the morning walking around LaGuardia in the uniform, trying to figure out now that I had the uniform, the hell do you get on these planes? <laughs> well, I got a little hungry about lunchtime, so I walked in the luncheonette in the terminal, sat down at the counter on a stool, ordered a sandwich. Moments later, a TWA crew walked in, flight attendant sat in the booth, pilot sat up at the counter on either side of me, captain right next to me. Back before deregulation, airline people just thought of themselves as one big family. They didn't hesitate a moment to talk to each other. And the captain kind of leaned over. Hey, young man, how's Pan Am doing? 
doing just fine, Captain. Tell me, what's Pan Am doing out here at LaGuardia? Pan Am doesn't fly into LaGuardia. They only go into Kennedy. Well, I picked up on that right away. Yeah, we came into Kennedy, had a few hour layover, came over to visit some friends of mine. Matter of fact, I'm on my way back to Kennedy now. But tell me, young man, what type of equipment are you on? Airline people have a lot of jargon for things, and one of them is they never call a plane a plane or an aircraft. They call it equipment, and what type of equipment you're on means what type of plane do you fly, back then a DC-8, a 707. Of course, I didn't know that, and I thought, what type of equipment am I on? The only equipment I'm on is this stool. They must mean what type of equipment is on the planes that I fly. So I thought, well, they have the wings, they have the engine. They always had a sticker on the engine, who manufactured the engine. So I said, yes, General Electric. All three pilots kind of just stopped eating and leaned over. <laughs> Captain said, oh, really? What do you fly? Washing machine? So I knew I said the wrong thing. Out the door I went. Everybody had an airline ID card, a plastic laminated card, like a credit card with a photograph, yet without the ID card, the uniform was worthless. I went back to Manhattan pretty discouraged, thinking where would I ever come up with a Pan American Airline corporate ID. I was sitting in the hotel room, I noticed a big thick Manhattan yellow pages, so I pulled them down on the bed and I flipped them open, I looked under the word identification. And there were three or four pages of companies who made convention badges, metal badges, police badges. I called up, finally one company said, listen, most of those airline IDs are manufactured by Polaroid, 3M company. You need to give one of them a call. So I finally got the 3M company on the phone in Manhattan. Yes, we manufacture Pan Am's identification system, along with a number of other carriers. How come? So I tell you, I'm a purchasing officer for a major U.S. carrier. I'm in New York, though, just for the afternoon. We're getting ready to expand our routes. We're going to hire a lot of new employees. We're going to go to a formal ID. I was very impressed with this Pan Am format. Wondered if I'd come by your office just to discuss quantity and price. By all means, come on by. So I went by just in a suit and a sales rep opened the book. Here we do, United, Delta, Eastern, Pan Am right here. Yeah, we like this Pan Am format. Wonder if you might have a sample I could bring back. Sure, I'll be right back. And he brought me back a five by seven glossy piece of paper with a picture of an ID card printed in the middle of it and blown up. Someone else's picture in the picture. John Doe for a name and in bold red ink across the front. This is a sample only. I said, no, I'm afraid this won't do. You know, I'd like to bring back an actual physical card. And by the way, what is all this equipment on the floor? Oh, no, we don't just sell these cards. We sell the system. Camera, laminator. Oh, we'd have to buy all of this. Absolutely. Well, I'll tell you what, since we have to buy it all, why don't you just demonstrate how it works and say, give me a sample. All right, here you go. Have a seat. They took my picture, <laughs> handed me the card, and out the door I went. I was... Uh, I was going down the elevator looking at the card, had a blue border across the top and Pan Am's color blue, but that was it. Not a single thing on the card said Pan Am. There was no logo, no insignia. This was a plastic card. You couldn't write on it, you couldn't type on it, you couldn't print on it. If you tampered with the plastic, you destroyed the card. Discouraged, I put it in my pocket, headed back to the hotel. But as I was walking back, I noticed I passed a hobby shop. So I walked in. Excuse me, sir, I see you sell a lot of models here. Yes? You have models of commercial jetliners? Sure, right over there. And I bought a model of a Pan Am 707 cargo jet for about $2.40. Took it back to my room, opened the box, threw all the parts out, and there at the bottom of the box were the decals that went on the model. And the little Pan Am logo that would have went on the tail went perfect, right at the top of the plastic card. And the word Pan Am and their special styling of graphics that would have went on the fuselage went perfect right across the top of the card and the clear decal on the laminated plastic made a beautiful identification card. Pan Am says they estimate that between the ages of 16 and 18, I flew more than a million miles for free. Pan Am says I visited numerous countries. But Pan Am says keep in mind that though Frank Abagnale did in fact pose as one of our pilots, he never once stepped on board one of our aircraft. That's correct. I never flew on Pan Am because I was afraid someone might say to me, you know, I'm based in San Francisco, been out there about 28 years, don't recall ever meeting you before. Someone might say, you know, your ID card is uh, not exactly like my ID card. So instead, I flew on everyone else. If I wanted to go somewhere, I just went out to the airport and looked on the board. United Flight 800 to Chicago. Then I went downstairs to the door marked United Operations. When I walked in, the operations clerk would look up. 
Hey, Pan Am, what can we do for you? I wonder if the jump seat's open on 800. Need a deadhead to Chicago. Jump seat? Yeah, it's open this evening. Like to get a pink slip pass. Need write me out a pass. I'd walk out, hand it to the flight attendant. She'd open the door to the cockpit. I'd step in. They had a captain, co-pilot, flight engineer, and a seat behind the captain called the jump seat, where pilots deadhead on company time. Now, because pilots love to talk shop, once you picked up that jargon, it was the same conversation over and over and over. So I would just step on board, even gentleman Bob Davis be around in Chicago, on the taxi out, always the same question. So Bob, how long have you been with Pan Am? Been flying about seven years. What position you fly? Right seat, which was airline terminology for a co-pilot. What type of equipment are you on? Had that one down, perfect. Matter of fact, whatever they flew, I didn't fly. So I had no problems with that. When I would arrive at the airport, I'd walk up to the Pan Am ticket counter. Closest I like to come to Pan Am people, the agent would be busy with passengers and look up. Sir, could I help you? Excuse me, where do we lay over here? I had the dead at a trip in for somebody got ill, never laid over in Chicago. Uh, we use the Parma House Hilton downtown, catch the crew bus on the lower level door three out. I'd go down to the Parma House Hilton and walk in, and on the corner of the registration desk, with a little sign that said, Airline Cruise, register here. That was just a three-ring binder, and you signed in, reference the flight number, showed them your ID card, they gave you a key. I'd stay two or three days, and Pan Am would be direct billed for my room and my meals. I also could write a check at the hotel, because I was an employee of the airline. The airline had a contract with the hotel, and as a courtesy, they'd cash your personal check up to $100. But then I found out that every airline honors every other airline employee's personal check up to $100, a reciprocal agreement still practiced today. So at the airport, a Delta flight attendant can walk over to an American ticket counter, show her Delta ID, and an American will cash her check, and vice versa. Of course, when I found that out, I'd go out to JFK or LAX, only I'd go to everybody, Northeast, National, KLM, Air France. It would take me a good eight hours stopping at every counter and every building. By the time I got all the way around the other end of the airport, at least eight hours had gone by. What do you have in eight hours? Shift change, new people. So I go all the way back around the other way again. I made a great deal of money. The only reason I quit at 18 is the FBI issued a John Doe warrant for interstate transportation of fraudulent checks. The John Doe warrant meant the FBI didn't know my identity. In the warrant, the FBI said that I was approximately 30 years old. I was 18, had a great deal of money. So I moved into a very swank singles complex called the Riverbend Apartments that just opened in Atlanta. On the application for lease, there were many questions, and one of them was occupation. I began to write down airline pilot, but the next question said employed by, supervisor's name, phone number. So I thought I needed to come up with something that would be pretty difficult to check out, yet something that would justify why I drive an expensive car, wear expensive clothes, and don't work much. So I wrote down the word doctor. First thing came to my mind, but I left it there. Had a very important apartment manager, very always interested, and she said, I see here you're a doctor. Uh, yes, ma'am. Type of doctor are you? Well, I'm a, um, I'm a medical doctor. However, I'm not practicing medicine right now. I left my practice out in California to come to Atlanta to invest in some real estate holdings. I won't be practicing for about a year. How interesting. Well, tell me, what type of medical doctor are you? And I figured, being a singles complex, pediatrician should be pretty safe. So I moved in, Dr. Frank Williams, pediatrician. Everybody called me Doc, always a typical question. So Doc, where'd you go to medical school? Columbia University in New York. Where'd you serve your internship? Harvard Children's Hospital out in LA. Once in a while, one of the guys would come over, hey Doc, look at my leg. I don't know what I did to it. Uh, Paul, I can't look at your leg. You need to go to your own doctor, have him examine it. One of the girls came over, always gave them a thorough examination, sent them on their way. <laughs> <laughs>